Mongolian legend up alongside. Now the lead is down to a neck into the turn. And it is Granada Flavor at the rail taking third. Mongol Altai and Mi Macho. Coming toward the quarter pole. And Mongolian legend on the outside up to take the lead. Perfecto Amor trying to cling to him. Mongolian legend just in front. Perfecto Amor a half length back. Five more to Granada Flavor top of the lane. And Mongolian legend is the leader. Perfecto Amor not surrendering, but he is second. Four back to Granada Flavor, third, 16th pole, and Mongolian Legend gradually pulling away. And Mongolian Legend, just too strong. Mongolian Legend wins it by almost three. Second to Perfecto Amor, and then Granada Flavor, followed by Mongol Altai. The pick six total pool right now at Golden Gate is over a half, just about enough. They're in the gate. And they're off. Airbus is going to the front. Overregulated has plenty of early gas. So too Bravestone on the outside. And Cool Acclaim is close up in the early going. Dark Marcus joins the early party. And on the far outside, just about enough. Has to go about five wide into the turn as we have a very rank Cool Acclaim on the inside. Cool Acclaim is headstrong in behind the dueling leaders. Rounding the first turn, Airbus and it is on the outside just about enough. And just about enough takes the lead. Bravestone now second. Airbus back to third. Cool Acclaim is now settling down in fourth. About five lengths off the lead. Overregulated outside of him. Then Dark Marcus sipping and kissing. Four lengths clear of Stemwinder. It's big at the back. They head toward the three-eighth pole. And it's just about enough. Leading it by two and a half to Bravestone in second. Airbus clearly third. Then Dark Marcus moving up outside Cool Acclaim. That pair followed by Sippin' and Kissin. Overregulated goes by him. It's big and stem winder. Approaching the quarter pole. Just about enough. Bravestone right to him. Two more Dark Marcus. Steady progress. Lime colors on the outside. And then comes Airbus. Overregulated. They turn for home. Bravestone up to take the lead. Puts a length in a hurry on just about enough in second. Dark Marcus in the center of the course trying to get that second spot as Bravestone opens up. It's Bravestone by two and a half, and he's home free. Bravestone wins it easily. Just about enough second. Third to Dark Marcus, then came overregulated, and it's big started rolling late. and American Heights. They're in the gate. And they're off. Secret fix very quick away from there. American Heights as well. And in between them, Musica joins the party, as does Martini Mischief. The two trailers, LB and Kirsten Bosch, down the back stretch. And it is Martini Mischief, leading while in hand, snugly in hand, in fact, three quarters of a length. Musica at the rail moves to engage. American Heights three wide in third. Then Secret Fix fourth, three lengths off the lead. It's another three to LB and Kirsten Bosch far back. Heading to the three eights. Musica, Martini, Mischief on even terms. Two more, Secret Fix and American Heights are side by side. LB pushed along, six in front of Kirsten Bosch. Five sixteenths out. Musica, Martini, Mischief continue to do battle. Two and a half more, Secret Fix angles off for a nice bid. And here's Secret Fix moving into second as Martini Mischief is tiring. They're at the top of the stretch. And Musica goes on with a three-length lead. Secret Fix second at the rail. Kirsten Bosch comes alive with a good-looking rally on the fence. Coming to the 16th pole. And it's Musica by three. Secret Fix, Kirsten Bosch. It will be Musica, another for Diego Herrera. 
Musica wins convincingly. Kirsten Bosch, one to watch in the future. Secret Fix was third. LB fourth. In the six, scratch number nine, explosive. Post time in 27 minutes. Commander Kai. Thanks, Maggio. And they're off. Commander Kai out quickly. Thanks, Maggio on the far outside. Swiss Woo is in between horses. And then comes Cherubic Factor, well-spotted fourth, four lengths off the lead. Big Scott Daddy and my summer dream are the next two, followed by General Mathis, and we are not bad people. It's a strung-out field. Down the back stretch, and it's Swiss Swoo, opening up two on Commander Kai, second. Thanks, Maggio, back to third. Cherubic Factor, four and a half off the lead. Another three, back to my summer dream, then Big Scott Daddy, General Mathis is trying to move through along the rail, and it is a long way to We Are Not Bad People. The field is midway on the turn. Swiss Swoo. Here's Commander Kai coming to engage, and in fact, running right on by. Commander Kai takes command at the top of the stretch. Cherubic Factor moves into second to chase. At the rail, Swiss Swoo has had enough. And they're followed by my summer dream. Outside General Mathis, a 16th to go. Commander Kai, three-length lead on Cherubic Factor, who's closing slowly. It's Commander Kai digging in, and Commander Kai gets there by a half length. Cherubic Factor second, close for third between my summer dream and General Mathis. Big Scott Daddy completes the super high five. Quick buck. All in. And they're off. Moose Mitchell bobbled. What in blazes very fast. Moose Mitchell, quick buck on the outside. Then Franklin One Star and Big Papa Steve. Three of them across the track, joined at the rail by Franklin One Star, making it four. It's what in blazes narrowly. Moose Mitchell ahead back second. Franklin one star, quick buck, just about a half length off the pace. A gap of four, big Papa Steve guided to the center of the track. Heading into the far turn. And what in blazes, surrounded on all sides, but still has the lead. Moose Mitchell, though, makes a move, and Moose Mitchell's head is now in front. What in blazes tries to match stride second. Franklin one star, two off them now. Then quick buck and another three to big Papa Steve. It's Moose Mitchell past the quarter pole, a neck in front of what in blazes who hugs the rail and fights back, a gap of five back to quick buck in third, final furlong, Moose Mitchell just in front, what in blazes, a neck behind, it's Moose Mitchell by a half length now close to home, and it's a triple for Diego Herrera, Moose Mitchell wins by a length and a half, what in blazes, quick buck, and Franklin one star. as well as the program scratcher number 12. Note that 10 and 11 both draw in. Golden Hour Double begins with the upcoming... They're all in line. And they're off. Fast start for Annie Song. Granola Girl comes away in second. Sunroof third in the early going. Rock the Bourbon rushes up on the outside. Eleuthera didn't have a good beginning. Moves through along the rail and is now vying for second as the field goes into the first turn. And it is Annie Song to set the pace, leading by a length and a half. Granola Girl in second. Eleuthera now takes third. Then comes Sunroof on the inside of Rock the Bourbon. 
two lengths clear of Duve Day. Squillions is toward the back of the field, passed by Midnight Silence with the white blinkers, and Rhea Moon is in between those two and under a hold as well. Down the back stretch, and it is Annie Song showing the way by just under a length to Granola Girl in second. Then it's a gap of about four to Eleuthera in third. Sunroof fourth, Rock the Bourbon is next. There comes Midnight Silence, who's asked to pick it up. Squillions is at the rail. Duvet Day between those two. And still Rhea Moon at the back. Around the turn, it's Annie Song leading by a half length. Granola Girl second. At the rail, Sunroof trying to get closer to Eleuthera. From the back of the field, Duve Day and Rhea Moon is widest of all, starting to get going now with some good strides. They're a furlong from the finish. Here comes Eleuthera on the outside. Eleuthera coming to Annie Song. In between those two, still battling on his Granola Girl, but Eleuthera hits the front late, and it will be Eleuthera to finish full a run by two. Rhea Moon a rallying second. Then came Annie Song in third. Sunroof was fourth. Granola Girl completes the super high five.
I love when my seminar guests exude a lot of confidence. And our seminar, seminar guest today exuded a lot of confidence. You want to know why? Prior to the seminar, I always ask my seminar guests for their selections. I always like to have their top two selections so that we, should, so that we can show them graphically to you on the set in between races. Not only did our seminar guest today give us two selections in every race, he said to me, exactly, I'm going to give you eight straight superfectus. Hi, everybody. My name is Tom Quigley, VIP player concierge, also your seminar host for the next 40 minutes. Delighted that you decided to join us on a glorious Friday afternoon here at the Great Race Place. And of course, the gentleman sitting next to me, former jockey, Iggy Puglisi. Iggy, welcome to the seminar. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, I've always uh, been watching from the sidelines, and uh, I, I was waiting to get my feet wet and jump in here and, and see what to see what happens. It's long overdue, that's for sure. You're at the track all the time, and of course, you were at the track all the time before you retired. I would see you occasionally uh, mingling with the gamblers and the trainers and walking around the uh, the grandstand. Let's first talk about how you got involved in the game. You were born in Argentina. You started riding at the age of 16. Did your parents introduce you to the game? Did you find it on your own? Did one of your friends tell you about it? How did you discover horse Never. racing? Uh, moved here from Argentina at a year old. So grew up in Temple City and nearby, nearby to be 100% honest, my parents were weekend gamblers. They uh -huh. would come out and, <laughs> you know, bet their their two bucks and uh, I would come out with them every chance that I got. And I think I hit the bug right around eight uh, where I really started seeing the horses up close and I had my, my own favorite horses at the time. And I just said, I, I wanted to be a jockey, you know, and, and it just kind of stayed. They, they thought it would pass. We just kept coming on the weekends. I would start sneaking away from school. Um, again, as soon as it was done, I would ride my bike, hop the fence. Don't tell anybody, but get into the track and watch the race is just, yeah, man, really be super passionate about it. Now you were kind of tall as a child, right? So you thought you might outgrow being a jockey. And un unfortunately, maybe for you, you never really grew, but that was good news <laughs> for your riding career because you were able to maintain being a jockey. And let me give you a quick, a quick statistic of your career. Iggy. I know you know these numbers, but our audience might not. You had 7,554 career mounts. You won with 826 of them. And perhaps your most prolific win was in the Delaware Oaks for uh, Nick and uh, Julio Canani. That uh, I see instantaneously that that puts a smile on your face. It is one of the the only horse tattoos that I have of, of many is <laughs> is of that wonderful uh, filly. And and not only uh, just for winning that race, just exceptional. There has been a handful of them that were different that I could tell right away than than most of the horses I had ridden. Um, Let's throughout stop. My I'm going to stop you there for a minute. How could you tell that they were different? She, uh, I worked her the first time at Hollywood Park. Uh, and Nick asked me to work at three quarters. He said it was a maiden. And I said, okay. And I worked her and I had taken that from Chris McCarry at the time where I was clocking all of my own horses on the stopwatch. And uh, she, uh, she went three quarters and one twelve. And then it was the gallop. Easily. Out. Yes. Super easy, which was way fast for me. And what I would usually go in, I was just impressed by the time. And then I looked at the gallop out time. It was still the straightaway. Um, but that gallop out time was like 123 for the seven eights. And it was done super easy. And at that point, I, I, you know, I said, wow, she's, she's pretty impressive. And he said, yeah, the thing is she's a maiden, but she's going to run in a stake race in, in New Mexico for like a 250, but you can go. And, and I went and she won as a maiden. She, she won that race. So her name was Island Fashion. Island Fashion yeah, and you won the Delaware Oaks in 2003. Yeah. And another nice uh, filly that you rode was Classy Cara. Sure. For Doug O'Neill. Exactly the, right. Yeah. Yeah. Won yeah. The fantasy stakes at Oaklawn Park. Beautiful filly. Yeah. You also won the uh, honeymoon handicap at Hollywood Park aboard her as well. That was one of the ones also that six when we talk about, and they've been Phillies, a lot of them, um, because I had mentioned it about Classic Care before she could do that. The honeymoon was on the grass and the fantasy was on dirt at Oakland Park. And she won in the same fashion on two very, very different surfaces, which, again, bumped her up in my eyes to a different, different caliber of horse. You also rode another horse for uh, trainer John Dolan way back when in 2001. You won the Long Anchors Mile aboard. Irish eyes are flying. You remember that uh, that mount, I'm sure. Oh, my goodness. I do. <laughs> Believe it or not. I asked other guys, like, I don't remember that. I'm like, I do. I, I cleared from the 10 hole. Uh, I remember drawing 10 and, and I had speed and I thought, oh, I don't know how many if I let two in, if there's going to be three or four, or how wide I would get caught. And I got a really good break. 
and uh, it's it's in it's in a wind picture that I have. But they also would give you a shot of the break, and it shows like my reins really dangling and the horse running off, and 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 he cleared from from the ten hole. So I I do remember that race, and I love Washington. You know, Long Acres and Emerald. You cut your teeth up there, right? You had to ride in Canada, even though you grew up in nearby Temple City. You had to ride up north, north of the border for a while, establish your uh, your career up there. But then, of course, you ended it down here in Southern California. But you had a lot of stops in between. I did, especially that first uh, year. I, I was moved around a lot. I uh, I wanted to get a jump. As you had mentioned earlier, I just didn't know when my growing would stop. And I was going to try to get in a year of riding. And you could start at 16. So I kind of put my foot on the gas and wanted to do it and ended up in a few different small tracks from from Playfair in Spokane, Washington, that's not there anymore, and quickly moved to Turf Paradise, from Turf Paradise to Golden Gate, and Golden Gate, I ended up in Canada, um, and it, I just, it, it resonated with me well, and I, and I won a bunch of races right away, and I just stayed, you know, it was it was uh, home, and I was young, and, 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 and it worked, I, I was lucky, I won the Canadian Derby when I was 17 years old, and that's another deer race that, that, that stays with me. Now, unfortunately, Iggy, your riding career got uh, cut short due to injury. How hard is it to walk away from the sport that you love so much, probably way before you wanted to hang up your tech? Yeah, it's difficult because you've always bounced back. We were talking right right before we went on air uh, about other guys and, and, and injuries, and you always kind of want to go out uh, in a certain fashion, or, or, or especially not being hurt, you know, because I've been asked a lot, are you back? And you know, I'm lucky. I've seen uh, other guys that have been injured way permanently. worse. Yes, uh, permanently, you know, severely injured. And I feel lucky. I rode 30 years, and I I did get hurt. I've broken my back three separate times in, in different spots. So it hurts, but I'm lucky. And if they said, you know, if the doctors told me to wrap, it's been 30 years. 16 to 46 is <laughs> here is tough. You know, it's it's a tough place to ride. There were, uh, you know, there's monster jockeys here and great horses. So, so I, I, uh, you know, I, I tip my hat at when you said those numbers. I was like, wow, that's pretty good. I didn't know there were that many wins, but you know, I'll take it. Now one door closes and another one opens, and of course, your writing career got cut short early. But you had been going out with a woman who you obviously love very much—a woman by the name of Michelle—and you just recently had a beautiful daughter by the name of Penelope. Talk to us about that new addition to your family. Yeah, Penelope, uh, PJ. Long time coming. Mama and I had been on a mission. <laughs> we weren't really trying to plan it to get it where I had all gray hair. Uh, but that's uh, that was the plan of the universe. And the, uh, she came. She came, uh, you know, in the beginning of COVID. So uh, it was wonderful. It was, it was a strange uh, experience because everything is kind of new. And, um, you know, uh, not just towards us, the way everything was you know going to the supermarket or going to a park with a child there everything was, we had to adjust and, and it's been a it's been a wonderful growing experience and she's her and my wife are everything to to me it's writing was one thing and and this is another and it's almost serendipitous that it it, it almost stopped at one so another one could continue i don't know you know i, I like to think of it that way Iggy's the salt of the earth. And of course, it's going to be a wonderful experience finding out who Iggy likes on today's eight race card. But before we do any of that, let's toss the microphone over to track announcer Frank Miramati so he can give us the early changes on today's Friday's card. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to San Anita Park. Here are the early changes. In the first race, no high five wagering with the scratch of number five, Ducks on the Pond. Note that number six, Missing Penny, is two pounds over. The track is fast, the turf is firm, the rail on the turf is at 20 feet today. Race two starts the early pick four. No changes. The third is the start of the Rainbow Six. 261000 in the jackpot pool for a single ticket winner. Six increased stakes, two pounds over. In the fourth, scratch number five, McCamerill. Late pick five starts with the fourth. 
In the fifth race, we kick off the late pick four. Just the blinker note. Race six, number six, Derby Quest, one pound over. Seventh is the start of the golden hour pick four. Number six, the rule of kings, one pound over. In the eighth, scratch three, cash equity, four, sniper kitten, and six, count of Amazonia. Three, four, and six are out. With those scratches, a revised morning line has been posted, and the golden hour double begins with race eight. Enjoy your Friday afternoon at the Great Race Place. Post time for the opener in 59 minutes at 12.30. Back to Quigley's Corner we go. Tom's guest today, Iggy Puglisi. Welcome back. We're talking horses with former jockey Iggy Puglisi. It's our honor to have him today on our set. And Iggy, before we take a look at today's eight race, I had a question for you. Prior to coming on the seminar, you and I exchanged text messages, and you said you were watching race replays, getting ready for today's seminar. We've never, most of us have never been on the back of a thoroughbred. You have. When you watch race replays, are there maybe some things you're looking for that we necessarily wouldn't be looking for? Well, I, I mean, everybody has taken the time to watch it. I think is looking for either a trouble trip or, or maybe an impressive stride or something. Um, I think the biggest advantage I have in that form is that for such a long time, we, you try and pick the right horse to ride in a race, which is tough enough as it is because you don't know who else you're running against at the time. You're trying to pick maybe between two horses. Now I, I get the advantage of seeing everybody and their post and the riders that I'm used to riding with. So I'll look like, oh, I know that because of X jockey, he's more than likely going to send no matter what. Um, Given his riding style. Sure, exactly. That's one real example in today's world, Edward Maldonado. It's a great example. Just like Eddie Delahousse, he can come from behind, but generally speaking, when a trainer puts a horse on a, when, when he puts Edwin on a horse, he wants the horse to show early speed. Right, or maybe it, it, the horse hasn't shown maybe that much speed and they're trying to get it, and he is exactly the, the example that I was going to go to. So that, and the the replay stuff i think um when it's little things that i could tell that's happening it might not be quite as easy for everybody else to see but that's just from writing that would be if anybody else that was you know a, a basketball player would tell me oh that happened there and i didn't exactly like i kind of saw it but i didn't know exactly what happened um so it's just more in detail that i could see that helps me a little bit what about riding instructions, Iggy? Of course, you looked when you were riding, you would look at the racing form and try and determine what the horse's running style was. And then you hook up with the trainer in the paddock, and maybe they give you different directions than you thought were forthcoming. How do you kind of incorporate that all in the first, you know, within the 10 minutes before you actually break from the gate? That or if your horse just tends to bobble and you were going to go, it's th those plans are out the window. You just instantly readjusting. You're, you think it might be a good idea. Like, okay, try, you know, clear. It, well, you say, oh, shoot, it's not that easy. Using a different word, but you say, oh, shoot, and kind of has to, like, you know, exactly. Like yeah, you know, or, you know, if they do want you to track and you break, sometimes they beat the gate. If they're sneezing, they'll fall forward and you're three in front and you're not going to wrestle a horse back. So now you're going to try and nurse that speed along. It's really just, it's, it's an, an instinctual thing that you have to adjust as the gates open. I mean, the plan is great. And with them, you know, you know, Zenyatta is going to go back and go around, sure. you know, but it's, always, it's always still, yeah, Zenyatta's. it's still difficult getting there. Well, yeah. It's not going to be difficult having you as our seminar guest today, because I know you've done the work. So let's kind of roll up our sleeves, even though we're both in short sleeves and beautiful <laughs> conditions here, of course, fast and firm in Southern California. We kick things off in race number one, sprinting on the turf course, six furlongs of the distance. Of course, race one begins the popular 50 cent early pick five. And this is for maiden claiming Phillies and mares in for a 62,000 
$1,500 claiming tag. The rails today are at 20 feet. We've got a field of six after the scratch of number five. The morning line favorite in the current betting choice is number two, Red Diamond from the Ron McAnally barn. Good to see Ron McAnally with a post-time favorite. Did you ever ride for Ron during your riding career? Uh, very few early on I did. Um, uh, it was just one of the guys out of all of them that I didn't get to hook up with as much. And it's important you mentioned uh, the importance of jockey agents prior to us coming on camera. And of course, you had one of the best in the business for a good portion of your career, Nick Casada. A good jockey agent can make or break really any jockey, can't they? It, it, it really seemed, um, you know, from where I was at, that that Nick at that time was really able to, to catapult me to, to a different level. I was riding just really good horses and I was traveling a lot and it was it was different so I'd, I'd like to think that yeah he had a lot to do with that it's, it's all about relationships that's for sure when it comes to trainers and jockeys let's talk about race one specifically here Eggy. who do you like and why in race one I ended up uh, sticking with a favorite in here, Red Diamond, just because uh, of his company lines. We're going back to uh, uh, Norma Jean B. That's that, that's a great horse of Vladimir Serene's. Yep. That Kenta Swarm was one on a couple times. The horse right, the, the line right before that is thrilling. A Michael McCarthy horse that won first time out. These are very strong horses. You got a first time starter on the inside of them and a first time starter on the outside. I think this is a five year old mare. It, the only thing she's got against her is that it takes her a little while to get her feet under her. But the horse that I thought would clear in here, the four, uh, Aventop, seems to get weary late. And I just think that Jose is going to have Red Diamond in, in a perfect spot and, and, and pick this horse off. Put you on the spot here, Eggy. I, I only know a little bit about the jockey, but do you know anything about the uh, jockey aboard number one, Spring Sinning? We can see that uh, the jockey, Kaner Zornet, is not a bug boy, so certainly has experience. I did a little bit of research. Do you know anything about uh, Kaner? I do not. Okay, so Kaner came from South America. He rode down there. Not sure how long he's planning to be here up in North America and specifically in Southern California, but it's an er interesting jockey assignment by trainer Louis Mendez because obviously a lot of his first time starters and lightly raced horses like to fire fresh perhaps he's trying to get a price or i don't know but it's not a bug boy and it's interesting that they drew the rail so probably gonna have to flash some early speed i would imagine that horse is going to be ready to go luis uh it does a great job with all those uh the babies when they get here they all seem like they've you know they just have a run. jump on everybody else <laughs> yeah all of his horses break well i've worked a lot of horses uh for for luis myself so it is it's a. Uh, I don't. I did not know the connection, and it is. Uh, it, it's got a, a very sneaky suspicion in there, and. I I got a feeling that horse is going to be leave there running, if anything. I missed your second selection on the graphic, uh, Iggy, but you, we know you like Red Diamond on top. If there was any threat to Red Diamond, who do you fear most in race one? I was guessing with uh, Dial Her, the three horse, first time starter by Dialed In. Uh, just a, a, a Philly first time starter that's been working at San Luis Ray, just because of the connections. They get Flavian. So, you know, if, if anybody in there, and like I said, the, my, my top selection does have to come from behind you know so if maybe this horse uh will, will get first jump but it, it, i just thought that the connections of gary barber were, were interesting a live horse two and three in race number one before we take a look at race number two a question for you of course one of your biggest supporters when you were riding was paul aguirre well, talk to us about the friendship and maybe the relationship you have with paul gosh uh really he's the one that changed everything i, I was riding in alberta canada uh and I, I would come down in the winters. The, the tracks would freeze over there and, and we would come down. And I, like I said, I lived in Temple City and I, I came out to work horses in Santa Anita. And Paul had said, didn't you just win some big race up in Canada? And I said, yeah. He said, have you thought about racing here? And that's how it started. And this, I want to say, was in 95, maybe. And and we got lucky right away. He put me on some horses and they all won. <laughs> it was just one of those things where I'm like, wow. And, uh, you know, it was just different. And not only that, it was just one of those people that you instantly get along with. And that's how it's been. I've known Paul, you know, 25 years now, and it's still the same. I, I see him even if I hadn't seen him in a while. And it's, you know, an instant uh, connection again. It, the, those years, that wasn't a... A, a, just a business thing or, or because he liked the style of my riding. I'm sure I messed up plenty of rides for him and he still rode me and, and managed to be my friend. So 
I love Paul. Yeah, he's great. A lot of friendships you can create here at the racetrack, not only on the front side, but also on the back side as well. Race number two begins the 50 cent early pick four. This time we're on the main track, six furlongs of the distance for Calbred. Maiden special weights, a field of five, number two area code. The only four-year-old in the field is a seven to five morning line favorite from the John Sadler barn. Second time starter going turf to dirt. What say you about race two, Iggy? I uh, I was all about area code myself. I, I watched uh, that replay this morning and I was impressed. Uh, this is a four-year-old Colt and he just looked like he was running spotty. Two or three times he took off. He was in a jam. It was on grass, but it, it just looked right to me. And the horse galloped out well afterwards. It just gave me all the signs that this horse will be on the improve. And the horse to beat the eight to five uh, uh, heaven's music on the inside tends to make a run and not quite get there drawn inside is going to eat more dirt today so i'm i'm happy i i, I like area code qu quite a bit in there it's interesting you mentioned number one heaven's music nine lifetime starts five seconds and one third without any victories and also area code as you mentioned from the john sadler barn maiden second time starters from his barn win at a 26 percent win clip according to the daily racing form race number three begins the 20 cent rainbow pick six the jackpot single ticket care over now up to two hundred and sixty one thousand dollars and we kick it off sprinting six furlongs on the turf course for calbred phillies and mares non-winners of one other than a field of six the morning line favorite on the rail number one you from the uh, Cliff Sice Barn, fresh off a of victory last time out. Juan Hernandez at Turf Paradise today to ride in multiple stakes races there, as is Abel Cedillo. That's why you don't see them on today's card. But, of course, they pick up a competent replacement jock in Flavian. What are your thoughts on race three? That's where I landed. Uh, again, watching the replay this morning, uh, I thought that uh, this three-year-old filly was very uh, impressive. Her stride uh, – just lengthened inside of the eighth pole. Uh, uh, Juan that day, JJ had asked her to switch leads and she threw it over and then really extended nice. That horse won in a good fashion. Uh, I, I thought because she's already proven on grass, I made my top selection. Another horse that I liked a little bit in there was a squared shady because I saw a few lines uh, down that this horse had bled at one time. And that sometimes is just a, a fix on medication or just a little bit of feeding or different training. And this horse was claimed to back and was ultra impressive. It, it was synthetic, but I think this horse is going to run big in there. So I'm landing on two horses. One and five in race number three. Before we take a look at race number four, Iggy, obviously you know your way around a horse. You've been on the back of many of them. Also, it sounds like you've spent a lot of time looking at the racing form. Do you have any aspirations to continue in the game? Do you want to be a jockey's agent? Do you want to be a trainer? Do you want to do something else maybe on the front side here with group sales or something like that? Like, how would you like to keep involved with the game if, in fact, you do want to keep it involved with the game oh 100 percent, yeah santa anita is is my home i'm here i, I couldn't imagine going anywhere else <laughs> you know to go to work it, it would be uh bizarre but yeah any of the 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 things they've all been ideas at one point or another um the agent thing uh i i thought about that seems like it might be tough i don't know i don't know if i'm built exactly for that uh it's it's just uh it's hard. You have to be a, a certain way, and, and I'm not. <laughs> what about being a trainer? So uh, trainers would be tough. I, I would think, if anything, I like, um, at least in this last little bit, I've been uh, doing some PR stuff here, meeting groups, introducing people. I got to meet some wonderful people, wonderful groups that have come in from Canada, that come in from all different places, and I introduce them and kind of give them an idea uh, about it. And I enjoy that part. Yeah, it's it's nice because you get to see the new fans. Goodwill Ambassador might be on Iggy's resume going forward, that's for sure. Race number four begins the 50 cent late pick five. We're one mile on the main track for three-year-old fillies, maiden special weights, a field of five after the scratch of number five. The odds on favorite number two, micro share from the Richard Mandela barn is four to five on the morning line. Before we get your thoughts on the race, Iggy, I wanted to watch the workout for number six, Sweet Talk, who is a second time starter going from turf to dirt for the Richie Baltus barn. This workout was one of the more recent workouts since uh, she last raced. And I wanted to watch this race together with you Iggy as she works in company and one of the things I saw as we watch and I know you didn't have the benefit of watching this is her running style her running style and I can understand why they put sweet talked on the turf first time out it's kind of like a high carriage hard hitting type of a running action as they turn in the lane here but this is still a good workout she outworks her uh, workmate on the rail and sweet talk although the time isn't necessarily fast she did it real easily just generally speaking as we're watching this workout and sweet talk is looming up on the outside without being asked what are some things you look for in the workouts when you're watching them, Miggy? 
Yeah, well, this looks, you know, ultra impressive just because the horse is in hand and, and traveling very easy. It, it looks like he's just, you know, overtaking the company right now. High knee action, it was the same thing. That I thought I could see why they went to, to grass. It sure does look that way, but that that's a that's a great work i did not get to see that that would definitely uh, <laughs> change that was that was a that was a, a very courtesy of our friends at xptv.com yes. you as handicappers wherever you're watching from around the country can watch those workouts on demand absolutely free of charge i would encourage you to visit that website now i had the benefit of just showing the workout right now for a sweet talk diggy you didn't see it prior to your selections who do you like in this race and why i ended up on micro shares uh it was just the, the tough company last time w with the Baffer horse that went off and won so easy. And M Mike didn't, wasn't all out in this horse to be second. He knew what he had. He loomed up inside, more of schooling, and the horse was second best. And it was, I think that is going to be Tower's best in here. The, the one horse that I have a feeling is going to be sent no matter what is brocade. And that would have been my, why do you say that in here? It, it just seems as this horse was, was bet eight to five first time out, kind of an empty effort. Second start off of a bit of a layoff sprinting hit gate. Didn't really not your typical Baffert, whether they're a, a touch slow away from there or not, they can get involved right away. So I think with the route, they put Johnny B on, they're going to go. I don't know if it'll work, if it'll last, but I, I have a feeling that that horse is going to make the lead today. Two and three, three and two in race number four. Before we take a look at race number five, again, another question for you. You've talked about Mike Smith. You've talked about J.J. Hernandez. You've talked about Johnny V. Obviously, you know all these uh, jockeys on a first-name basis. When you first started riding in Southern California, did you have a mentor in the jocks room that maybe took you underneath his, his wings and said, look, you're doing this wrong, you're doing this right? Did you have anybody, or did you have to do it all on your own no you understand i was writing with my idols from that time that we said that i wanted to do it on it was like young kids looking at jordan or whoever they're OB. superstars yes exactly it was i had lafitte and mccarran eddie d you know the hall of fame this is the lineup is bonkers <laughs> if, if you just start okay and then people that you, you kind of you know like aunt lee or Pedroza. you know just a ridiculous and then you could go to like fair riding and catch even tougher riders antonio castignon please the guy was just as strong and as good as you can get so it's it was all of them were helping me and, and especially young when you get here young and you ask and, and you're not scared to I would I would say, wow, man, or I got stopped in here. What could I do? And all of those guys were so classy. I would, you know, I, as my favorite as a rider, probably the style fitting uh, Eddie D was so exciting to watch. But as a as a person to go into the room and ask uh, in any subject of what happened or maybe even give you a break if he saw you were in real trouble in a race was Chris McCarron. Yeah. That was, CJ, that's my man. CJ Lafitte, Eddie D, the list is endless, and those memories are strong. Race number five begins the 50 cent late, late pick for today. We're sprinting five and a half furlongs on the main track. $12,500 is the claiming tag, non winners of two races lifetime, a field of seven, and the morning line favorite number four. Sometimes always two to one on the morning line for trainer Steve Knapp. There are three runners exiting this race that ran uh, last time that they competed against each other. That would be back on, as I turn the page here, that would be back on February 12th, the sixth race. You can see See that exiting that race were number four, sometimes always number five, musical gem number six, me likey. And the winner who turned out to be Fury Cap actually rides and uh, runs in race seven today. So we're able to watch this replay forthcoming and look at the uh, performances of four horses, three in this race, as well as in uh, one in race number seven. Let's listen to track announcer Frank Miramati get them around on February 12th. They're in the gate. And they're off. Very even beginning. Sometimes always is going straight to the front. He is joined early by me, Likey, in second. Down at the rail, Musical Gem rushes right into contention. And Fury Cap on the outside for them, Vi for supremacy. Then it's El Durango. Circle back toward the back of the field and Sir Flatter outside of that pair. Into the far turn, Fury Cap takes the lead. Quickly puts almost a length on sometimes always in second. Then me likey moving up in third. It's another two and a half lengths back to the next flight. Headed by musical gem inside El Durango. Sir flatter and circle back. They have a quarter of a mile to go. Fury caps in front. 
Me likey on the outside and at the rails. Sometimes always not done. He's very game and fighting back. They're in the final furlong. Fury cap, half length lead. At the rails, sometimes always in very tight, just steadied slightly. Four back to me, likey in third, coming to the 16th, and it's Fury Cap opening up late. And Fury Cap wins by a length and a half. Sometimes always second. Then it was me likey third, musical gem, and Sir Flatter completes the super high five. That's a triple for Flavian Pratt. Fury Cap winds up victorious, comes back in today's seventh race. But first things first, Diggy, we saw sometimes always finish a good second to Fury Cap. Me, Likey, and Musical Gem were also in the race. Are one of those your selections in race five, or are you looking elsewhere? It is. I, I ended up on sometimes always in here. And for the most part, I know people look at a line like this. Uh, this horse has started 11 times, only one win, six seconds. So you tend to think that it's a horse that, that doesn't want to win. I have almost the opposite opinion of this horse. I think he's up over trier i can see him on the head on and it looks even his body the way that he moves that he's trying really hard that last race was tough he was pinned inside of a horse that runs today uh, uh, later on the saddler horse that is was impressive and this horse you know these are two different levels now he hits 12-5 this is the right horse in here today who else do you like in the race if you're spreading for a late pick four purposes iggy I thought that there was a turnaround on Mad Catter. Uh, I didn't know if it was a little bit of the layoff or not. Uh, the horse hustled from the inside and was there the whole way. He didn't seem like he had to work much. Diego rode him great. I mean, maybe he took advantage of, of, of an easier early lead, but the horse looked well doing it. So so I ended up as, as Mad Catter as my second choice. Fair enough. Four in one in race number five. Let's take a look at race number six. Back on the turf course, mile and an eighth is a distance. Allowance optional claiming types, fillies and mares. Non-winners of one other than a field of eight. Number five, Accelerina for the birthday boy. Trainer Phil D'Amato is the nine to five Moyer line favorite ridden by Flavian once again. What say you in race six, uh, Iggy? Here we are again on the same horse, Accelerina. Uh, ultra impressive to watch. Uh, it's, you could tell when there's, there was almost zero pace on in that last race going to mile and an eighth. They went 48 and three, 113 to the three quarters. And she went from last to first in a very short amount of time, inhaling and opening up on horses that were still running. So it's difficult to get around that part of it. The, obviously a much tougher company today, but I, I thought that it was just such an impressive uh, tape that, that she ends up being a, as my top selection and nothing wrong with the seven horse in here. That horse is going to be forwardly placed, big works coming in and, on that horse's replay, she galloped out afterwards, too, just got out knotted. Flavian rode both Accelerina as well as number seven, Anna Glesa, your top two selections in the race. Umberto climbs aboard the one that Flavian flees. As a handicapper, do you read into that that Flavian likes the, the uh, Philly more? Or maybe is it just a function of the other one got entered late, Flavian was already booked? Like, how do you, how do you kind of decipher that as a handicapper, Iggy? Well, again, now this is where I think uh, where I get lucky where as – a jockey they had to pick pre-race now you get to see even you know post uh, post position and and who's on what so that's why i i did give that the outside horse umberto's horse a shot because uh, she's going to be in front of the the pratt horse they're both uh phil the motto horses uh, but I, I believe that the seven is going to have early position in a race where there isn't a ton of pace. That's the good part about it now is that you look over it and there's just not as much. And, and Flavin's horse is going to have to make up the ground, Accelerina again, and work out a bit of a trip. But I believe those two are the, are the correct horse. Accelerina fooled me in the paddock last time she ran in her North American debut. She looked very dainty. She actually weighs 897 pounds, or at least she did for that race back on February 6th. We'll see if she put a little bit more meat on her bones today for her career start number two in North America. Race number seven begins the $1 Golden Hour pick four, linking our last two races here at Santa Anita with the last two races at Golden Gain. We kick things off sprinting six furlongs on the main track. $32,000 is the claiming tag. Number one, I'm Corfu for Britain. Brittany Vandenberg, the Midwest-based trainer, is 9-5 to five on John White's morning line and the favorite second start here in Southern California. Give us your thoughts on race seven, Iggy. Did I got to see the replay on this seven-year-old, and these are, you know, just the, the, the type of horses that I loved in my riding career, you know, uh, just grinders, seven-year-old geldings. They, they just have a different feel to them you know they just they're professional race horses and that's what this horse is he's in he's in heats where they go 21 flat 44 that's different than races that go 46 is just a different field the horses are running 
full steam almost the whole way, which, you know, separates, you know, there's a big line there. And that's why the inside horse is, is going to be ultra tough in there. He's this, uh, the horse that, that he comes, the race comes out of Principe Carlo came back and ran second last week big second. in another big heat. This, this is the right horse. And for 32, I wouldn't be surprised if, uh, you know, there's people, people looking, uh, this at this at this seven year old gelding. We saw Free Our Cap win in the replay we watched just a few races back. Now it takes a big jump up to thirty three thirty two thousand dollars. Is that your second selection or are you looking elsewhere? I didn't. I ended up on quick finish in here. Uh just uh, the horse had to be dropped. It was one of those horses that just wasn't getting there, wasn't getting there. It was always got the same kind of third or fourth place effort. And the the numbers seemed to be fast enough, even buyer wise. And then the last drop, the last race the horse won easy, but it had, it seemed like he had things go his own way. You know, he got to make an easy lead and then kind of pat it and pat it, but it looked impressive. So again, I'm like, yeah, maybe, uh, you know, a lightly race horse. He was claimed. Uh, I ended up on quick finish as my second choice. We close out the day in race number eight with the $5 golden hour daily double similar concept last race here with the last race at golden gate. And we're going one mile on the turf course allowance, optional claiming types, non winners of two other than there are three scratches in the race declare out of the race. Number three, four, and six leaves us with a field of seven on the revised morning line favorite on the bottom. Number 10 Anaconda is now five to two on the morning line. Before we get your thoughts on the race, Iggy, I want to watch a replay of number six seven evening sun who hit the front last time out and then just missed you'll see trained by jeff mullins broke from post five in a field of six will be four wide in the first turn this trip was so difficult that it actually made a highlight uh, reel for trip note pros who does uh, such great work absolutely free of charge on the sania website you can find their work there but i'll be quiet let's listen to frank miramati describe the action back on february 4th and watch the replay for number seven evening sun They're in the gate. And they're off. Sash, a little bit awkward early, but showing plenty of early speed. Dicey Mochara up alongside. And on the outside of them, it's Evening Sun, a joint third, racing on the outside of Flashiest. Perfectionistic is down on the inside. An awfully naughty trails the compact group. Sash will set the pace. Leads it by three quarters of a length. Dicey Mochara in second. Then flashiest evening sun. Perfectionistic on the insides. A little bit keen. And just outside of him comes awfully naughty. They move around the clubhouse turn with Sash the leader by a length and a half. Dicey Mochara is in second. Perfectionistic gets a little breathing room and comes through along the inside. Flashiest in the pink silks is three lengths off the lead, then awfully naughty and evening sun. Down the back stretch they go. Sash and Kyle Frey by a length. Dicey Mochara comfortable in second. Perfectionistic at the rail, and flashiest remains outside of him as they pass the half mile pole. Awfully naughty, evening sun. Less than five lengths covers them. Sash still by just under a length. Dicey Mochara now moves to engage second. Flashiest outside of them, three wide, a length and a half off the lead. Perfectionistic, evening sun, awfully naughty, several chances with a quarter of a mile to go. And Dicey Mochara takes the lead. Tackled though on the outside by evening sun and evening sun, a menacing presence, puts his head in front on the far outside, awfully naughty surfaces late. And in the meantime, Dicey Mochara not done and coming right back for more. Dicey Mochara, evening sun, Dicey Mochara, Pratt had plenty left in the tank and they end up winning three quarters. Evening sun made a bid, but had to settle for second. Then awfully naughty third photo between flashiest and perfectionistic. Evening sun, Iggy came home in 12 seconds, the final eighth, but still wasn't good enough. Second best that day. Is evening sun going to hit the winner circle today? He he could be. I, I think that this horse, uh, you know, it might be tough to time to ride. It's it's twice where he's made a move, made the lead, and kind of pulled up. So uh, I think Mike is, is going to have this horse on, on the right trip today. Who else do you like in the race, Iggy? 
I'm going to go with a horse that I usually uh, avoid, a horse that's only one sprinting, but I'm so impressed with Anaconda from the outside that I'm going to give it one more shot uh, uh, routing. It, the horse just was ultra impressive, galloped out really well. So uh, my top selection, Anaconda in the last race. 10 and 7 to close it out here at the Great Race Place. Iggy, thank you so much for your time and insight. was a blast walking down memory lane with you. Best of luck not only in your career, but also with your new family. Wonderful. Thank you for having me. It was a blast. Of course. Thanks to all of you for watching as well. We couldn't do it if you weren't watching. Hope you make some money today playing the races. Have fun, everybody, and good luck.